The epistle reading is Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with the first verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the words were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him for the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that had foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared them a city for them. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is Luke chapter 12, beginning with the 32nd verse. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes, truly I tell you. He will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. As I've gotten to meet a lot of you, many have asked how I like working here. I think many of you have recognized that Myers Park United Methodist Church is not like other churches. This is a large church and in many ways is staffed almost more like a corporation. The church runs efficiently and holds itself to a standard of excellence. I was trained in seminary to be prepared to be a pastor of a smaller church by myself. So in many ways, I have not been trained to be at a church this large. But in many ways, this place feels more like home for me. I've told many of you that I was born and raised in Michigan. I am from the Metro Detroit area, and my parents are both engineers. My introduction to the corporate world was General Motors. When I thought of myself in the professional world, I, I think I envisioned myself in something larger than maybe being at a church by myself. So, like I said, I grew up with engineering parents, which means my household ran like an engineering household. We had rules and systems, and everything was 
done a certain way and always done with excellence. My dad set our clocks five minutes early to make sure that we were always on time because on time was late. And I knew exactly what the right way to do things were. So when I went off to college, I had, had, a, I had been steeped in a pretty good sense of excellence. In this way, it is very deep in my DNA to value efficiency and to hold myself to a standard of excellency. So it will come to no surprise to this congregation that I have really liked working at Myers Park. On my first day, I was given clean, concise folders with policies and systems and rules telling me exactly how to do things and how things worked around here. I never had to guess. Meetings were always kept to an hour and sometimes less, and every publication we sent out went through multiple eyes of edits to make sure that we were always putting out an excellent product. Maybe these are the kind of things that have drawn you to Myers Park United Methodist Church. We are people who value excellent things. We know what success looks like, and we are people who know what a good investment is when we see it. The message that Paul delivers to the Hebrews is not a message for anyone looking for a good investment. Our scripture reading from Hebrews today might make a practical and analytical person make a, feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe some of you felt that way today. In the letter to the Hebrews, Paul makes the claim that faith is the confidence in what we hope for, in the assurance in the things we do not see. Hope in things we do not see is a high-risk investment. It's ignoring the budget, throwing away the statistical trends, and buying stock in something that has every indication of sinking the corporation. Faith does not make sense to the practical, reasonable, and measured people and how they go about doing things. And Paul does not simply make this claim about a relationship to, between faith and hope and leave us to interpret it. Paul tells us that this is about the covenant between Abraham and God, and he shows us exactly what this faith looks like. Paul tells the story of Abraham, and he tells the story of a man who shared a dream with God to be the ancestor to many, to move to new lands and to prosper for generations. This is an old man with a barren wife who wanted to be the father of a nation. Abraham, I think, knew in the back of his head that this wasn't a good plan. He knows his ch chances did not look great. He knows that he is old and his wife has passed childbearing years. But he had faith in God and he believed that it would maybe be possible. But so they dream this dream together, God and Abraham. And God promises Abraham that he will have more descendants than stars in the sky. And despite all the ways that Abraham calculated and knew exactly how unlikely this was, he has faith and he believes that he will indeed become the father of a nation and his son would be born to him and his wife. But what I love most about this covenant that's at the center of our faith is the size of this dream that Abraham dreams. And with God's help, Abraham dreams this dream and they do it together. Abraham's dream was not likely. He was the dark horse for the patriarch of a nation. And why can't God choose the obvious choice just once and make it easier on us? It's so much easier for us to have a God who lets us invest in a promising hire, to put our money in a promising stock market, or to pull for a team who might win the national championship. High-risk investments are not what we generally seek out as a people group. But God chooses Abraham despite all the logical markers that this is not the guy you choose to build your future with. It doesn't make sense, but God and Abraham enter into a covenant, and Abraham believes the impossible, that he will have more descendants than stars in the sky. I started to learn all about the ways in which God chooses the unlikely in my first internship at a church. This church was situated in a low-income neighborhood in Indianapolis, Indiana. My role was to supervise young high schoolers who also lived in the neighborhood. The model of the ministry was built around uh, finding out ways to connect and share and empower the gifts that were already present in that community. So essentially, we were just walking around the neighborhood meeting our neighbors. Success in this 
um, ministry was often not seen for weeks and sometimes years. I can't say that it was the most rewarding work I've ever done. And I remember one day I was talking with my supervisor about all the ways that we could systemize and make the work better. I had this brilliant system planned. I had policies and rules that I wanted everyone to follow. And I was, I was really dreaming a way to make this easier for, for me and the other supervisors. And my supervisor let me talk for a while, but when I finished, he looked at me and gave a long pause and said, I hate to tell you this, Taylor, but Jesus does not care about efficiency. And just like that, I realized a very significant part of my childhood formation was up against me as my, in my role as a pastor. Jesus is not efficient, and ministry does not have to be either. Sometimes God chooses the least likely guy to be the father of an entire nation. I'd like to say that I've effectively repented for my, from my need for perfection and order, but I assure you I have not. I sat with this text and I realized how bad of a dreamer I was. I have allowed practicality to cripple my ability to actually hope for anything. And I believe myself to be a generally hopeful person, but the actual act of dreaming of something real, to actually name, this is what I hope for, this is what I'm dreaming of, I'm not that great at it. I'm much more likely to approach a ministry situation with a let's make it better mindset, to invest in my time and people and ministries that seem to have the most potential for success. But that success is not determined by God. And it's never quite the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit stirs in places we don't expect and enables people we didn't think could do it. And we are called to have faith in those unlikely ways that God works even when it doesn't map onto how things are supposed to go. This is unnatural for me. It constantly requires me to question my inclinations and let the spirit work in slow, odd, and sometimes frustrating ways. And the beautiful reality that accompanies our letting go of practicality is that we are finally able to dream. We are able to say exactly what we hope for. We are able to see the world as God sees the world. And I know this is hard, but I realize that when I fail to hope, I can't be a person of faith. I have to have something worth hoping for in order to have this faith that Paul is calling us to. When we take this scripture seriously, our ministry dreams have to change. They have to go beyond well, it might cost too much, or maybe people won't show up, or I'm too busy. We have, to go, we have to dream bigger. But the thing about dreaming this way is that we cannot have faith in, in the things unseen if we do not know what we are trying to see. We have to be bold in naming and telling people and showing them what our dreams are. We have to have the courage to actually say to God, this is what I dream of, this is what I hope for, and to listen to God when God gives us those dreams too. So Myers Park, I wanna know, what is our dream? What is the thing that we're hoping for? When we say hope is here, what is that? What is currently unseen that we have faith that we will see one day? The other day, one of our clergy, Nathan Aldridge, shared with me one of his dreams. He has a dream of an art installment that takes up a whole wall somewhere, and it's going to, he wants it to be a banquet feast where there's seats at the table for some of our past and present saints. He wanted a seat for Hagar and Noah and Boaz and Abraham, Isaiah, Rebecca, the Syrophoenician woman, Mother Teresa, Malcolm X, our new friend Gregory Boyle, people from all across the theological spectrum. He wanted a seat for Billy Graham, Bono, Oswald Chamber Chambers, heroes from other faiths and ethnicities, and he wanted them all sitting together and sharing this meal. He wanted the food to be from all across the world, representing the diversity of cultures. He wanted some people eating with forks, others with chopsticks, some eating with their hands. This was a beautiful dream he shared with me, a table that had no rules, a table we'd find in heaven. This is a dream of Nathan's, and it's a faith-filled dream. Nathan has an image of hope. 
And this may seem like a silly exercise to imagine a heavenly banquet so literally, but only a couple days after Nathan shared this dream with me, I was scrolling Facebook and I saw that he had posted a picture of a birthday cake. It was a German chocolate cake, which was his late father's favorite kind of cake. He talked about having a slice of this cake on his dad's birthday allows him to join in the banquet feast of the saints. And as he ate this cake, he knew it was a foretaste of the kingdom where he would be reunited with his father again. This was a faith-filled dream. Dreaming these dreams, having faith that we all sit at the same banquet feast is not childlike or silly at all. These are the kind of dreams that speak life into death, joy into grief, and faith into hopelessness. And when we do this, our world starts to change. We live differently when we have faith in the things hoped for. When we are people who believe that we have life after death, when we believe that sin will be no more and suffering will no longer exist, when we are all created in the image of God and we will sit at one banquet feast together. This is the type of faith that requires us to have hope no matter how unworthy a person may seem, this encourages us to know that that person is beloved by God. This past week, when we heard Father Gregory Boyle speak, he showed us what this kind of radical faith looks like. Father Greg shows us through the ministry of Homeboy Industries that we have to believe and trust that the members of his community, who happen to be uh, members of gangs, are God's beloved that God has called and equipped these people to be beautiful additions to our world and communities. It was so tempting for him and the people of his community to write off these people because they had gang tattoos on their face, or they had a criminal record, or they were just seen as dangerous or someone to be avoided. But Father Gregory had faith in the unseen. He has faith in his community, that his community was full of God's beloved children who were equipped by the Spirit to enliven the life in the city of L.A., and we are all better for it. It is a big risk to be people to have faith without sight. It is not easy to take risks on people. The forces of racism, fear, and prejudice fight hard for us to write off people groups but we know that these are missed opportunities to live into the fullness of the kingdom. To have faith without sight, we have to trust in the goodness of all people. And this kind of faith, it dissolves titles. It dissolves the titles of criminal, illegal immigrant, sexual deviant, poor and needy, and all that remains is beloved child of God. This kind of faith requires us to listen in new ways, to look for gifts and signs of belovedness in those we meet. It requires us to celebrate and embolden people who have been forgotten or deemed less worthy. It requires us to reorient the way we do things, to listen and see people in new ways. We might have to break the rules. We might have to lose some policies and take a break from efficiency just to see how the spirit is moving. And we, as the community of Myers Park United Methodist Church, we're already set up well to do this. You are sitting in the same pew as someone who probably disagrees with you politically, yet you shared with them the peace of Christ just moments ago. And we're saying together, hope is here. And you're living into it just by being here this Sunday. You're coming together despite all those differences to worship a God that we all love together. And we have this God that we are worshiping is a God who promises us abundant futures, one greater than the stars in the sky. And every day we have to resist a, to dream too small. We have to participate in a kingdom so radical that life conquers death, the poor are blessed, and those who mourn will be glad. It is not a good investment. It will not be efficient. But let's be people who have faith for what we hope for and the insurance and the things we cannot see. Amen.